All right, before I get started, good to have some Apes fans in the uh, audience. Uh, if you're cheering already, I'm assuming you watch Apes videos because there's no other reason you know who I am. Um, at any rate though, I want to start actually just by thanking you all for being here. I know you sort of have to be here, but you also are lending me your attention and your time. And we're going to talk a lot about managing resources today. And because it's Earth Week, we're going to talk about environmental resources, but time is a huge resource. So I appreciate you lending me some of your time. Um, you're never going to get more of it. So <laughs> thanks for spending a bit some, some of it here with me. Um, all right. So we're going to start with a joke because jokes are a good way to start things off. If you know the punchline of the joke, I need some help here, okay? So the setup for the joke is how do you know someone is a vegan? Oh, there we go. Uh, somebody said the right answer, which was they will. Yeah, or you say like, oh, don't worry, they'll tell you, right? Um, so here's the kind of joke, the dad sitting at the table. Oh, don't worry, Susie, you'll know if someone's a vegan. Um, and then there's this meme, which you might have seen. This might also be you when finals are coming up, I don't know. Um, so I want to start off with this joke, and he's going to stay up there for a minute so you can you know, really take it in, that even though this is kind of a silly joke, I think it illustrates two really key points to sustainability. Uh, and those key points of today's message, don't worry, he's coming back, uh, our individual sustainability is overrated and that it's a team sport. And I know you guys play a lot of team sports here at BES, and so the team sport analogy is going to kind of run deep through today uh, and the message. So the trick here is there is some truth to this joke about vegans and vegetarians. Sometimes they can be kind of insufferable. Um, they might shame you or they might kind of brag about what they do. Uh, and that can just be obnoxious. It's just not a really good way to go about getting other people to care about sustainability or animal welfare, right? Um, sitting alone at the lunch table, eating your veggie burger because no one wants to hang out with you, it doesn't really make a real difference in our food system, right? The second point that I think is it illustrates a little bit of irony in the critique or the criticism of veganism because if you choose veganism or vegetarianism because of sustainability reasons, you really want to tell other people about your choice. The point is to have other people care about sustainability as well. And so, you know, to make any real progress at any kind of scale, you need a team working collectively. And you can't have a team without telling anybody about it, right? You've got to do some recruiting. So I just want to be clear, though, today's speech is not about veganism and vegetarianism. And to be clear, I think that, you know, people are omnivores. There's a ton of completely natural reasons to choose to eat meat. It's a really deep cultural practice for most cultures and most peoples. And so just want to make it really clear that that's not today's message that you have to convert to veganism or vegetarianism. And the ape scholars I talked with this morning uh, can attest to that. I already told them that is not what I'm here to do. But the current production of meat is somewhat unsustainable, and we're going to talk about why. But before we do that, we need a definition of sustainability. So Hannah Ritchie uh, is a fairly young person in the climate change world. Uh, she wrote a phenomenal book called Not the End of the World, which is a really great book about climate change. And I like her definition that providing a good life for everyone today while protecting the environment for future generations, uh, this is how she sees sustainability, and this is kind of the lens that we are going to use to examine it today. So kind of put simply, if we go back to the idea of eating meat in the amount or the quantities we do in wealthy countries like the United States and a lot of Europe, uh, that amount just can't be sustained. We can't quite pull that off for all of Earth. And so if everybody ate kind of the amount of meat that we eat in the US or Europe, we could only feed about 2.5 billion people. So it doesn't exactly mesh with the a good life for everybody kind of idea to eat as much meat as we do. Um, so that is why I wanted to start with this kind of idea of eating vegetarian or veganism um, or vegan. Uh, but we have uh, a little more data to kind of back this up. Uh, and that's because it takes you know roughly 10 times as many calories of feed input to uh, raise, you know, animal meat as it does to raise plants. Um, and that's specifically for kind of for cattle. Although we have a turkey farmer or two in the audience maybe, so turkeys are a little bit better. You know, if you want to eat a little more sustainable meat, you know, go with the turkey. They're a little more efficient than cows at converting that feed to, um, 
to eatable, you know, turkey meat. And, you know, every once in a while we pardon a turkey too, just to make sure they know we care about them. All right, so I also want to throw up a map of VES just to help visualize a little bit. When I did my counting, I found about six roughly football field sized areas. Uh, and so based on that math of, you know, two football fields worth of land feeding one person if you raise cattle uh, or 14 people if you grow plants, VES could have about three carnivores on campus if you use all of that to raise cattle or you could have 42 vegans. Now, I realize um, if these are the 42 vegans, you probably are gonna go with the three carnivores as your classmates on campus. Um, you probably don't wanna hang out with three of this type of person, I get it. Uh, but I just wanted to give you that perspective in terms of sustainability. Um, this is though where we're gonna take an off ramp from veganism and vegetarianism. So we're gonna kind of wrap up that aspect since that's not the focus today. Uh, and that's because there's a ton of measures of sustainability. So if we take a look at the screen, Agriculture is at the bottom. It has an impact on how sustainable we are, but it's just a small piece of the pie, right? This is not the end-all, be-all thing. So you don't have to be vegetarian to be sustainable or to think about sustainability. So we're going to kind of take the off-ramp. Um, and again, just on the math aspect of it, it was about 10% uh, you know, of the calories that go into feeding an animal actually make it to the person. If you don't trust me, you can ask the ape scholars in the audience. So ape scholars, can you guys raise your hands for a second? There you go. So find one of those people later and ask them about the 10% rule and the second law of thermodynamics. And then they can explain that to you because it's going to be on their exam coming up. Uh, so as we move on though, uh, I only really started there to set up the two central messages that we're going to be returning to over and over today, which again is that individual sustainability is overrated and that sustainability is a team sport. Uh, and again, I just can't stress this enough. Everybody in my life uh, that I love and care about eats meat. All my friends do. I assume most people in the audience do, so that is not what I'm here to do. I just wanted to set up today's conversation by reminding you um, how not to go about sustainability, which is like our friend who is about to pop a blood vessel in his head. Uh, just out of curiosity, before we move on, are there any fellow vegetarians or vegans in the audience brave enough to raise their hands? Oh, there we go. Oh, we've got a good number. Excellent. X? Why did you leave the, the tradition, if I may ask? You bought a cow? That's pretty sustainable. Do you raise the cow? Your mom does? That's excellent. What's that? You just pet them. That's good. Interacting with your food that way is, is, is that's a path to sustainability. I appreciate that. So for all those people that just raised your hands, if you're friends with them, you have my permission to remind them they have to be the nice, friendly vegetarians and vegans, not the memeable ones that blow a blood vessel when you haven't asked them about it in eight minutes. Uh, so on we go back to our team sport metaphor. If you're a vegan or a vegetarian and you're bragging to other people or like making fun of them or shaming them, it's kind of like being on a football team or a soccer team with only four players. Like, you're not going to win many games, right? Not a very good team if you only have four players. Uh, and then if you're bragging and shaming, it's just like, it's the idea of like padding, you know, individual stats on a losing team. Nobody's really impressed, right? You want people to uh, want to get involved with what you're talking about. Uh, to understand though why sustainability has to be a team sport, we're going to look a little closer at some of the shortcomings of individual sustainability and then kind of a surprising proponent who pushed the idea of individual sustainability. So by a show of hands here, who has heard the phrase carbon footprint before I just mentioned it? Okay, almost everybody. I saw almost every hand go up there. What's really interesting is you may have even calculated your carbon footprint. Raise your hand again if you've actually calculated it. So if you used an online calculator, does anybody know theirs? Like remember it? It's probably measured in tons, maybe something like six to 10, depending on your lifestyle, maybe a little higher. Uh, so does anybody know what are some things other than what you eat that contributes to your carbon footprint? We'll see who paid attention to the slide a few seconds ago. Say that louder. How you travel. Anything else? What you produce, the trash you produce, ends up in a landfill. Definitely, that releases a lot of methane, takes up land. Anything else? So we've got travel, trash, what you eat. 
what type of electricity you use and how much. Well, you're using all the same type, but where it came from. <laughs> uh, Any more? Yeah, over there. Yo, yeah, that's going to be a primary driver of your home energy use, for sure. So you guys are actually, uh, you did a great job. Let's see, what did we leave off? So we've got your building, fuel, um, waste. You guys really did an excellent job with that, actually, all around. Uh, so pretty well educated here about carbon footprints already, which is awesome. What's interesting, though, is that if I had been in the audience as a middle schooler or a high schooler 20 years ago, and there had been a speaker asking myself and my friends about the carbon footprint, probably not a lot of us would have raised our hands. Uh, and that's not because climate change wasn't understood to be an issue 20 years ago or that nobody cared about carbon footprints, but it's because there was a very specific ad campaign to put the word carbon footprint into the lexicon. Scientists always talked about ecological footprints, which just measure land use, not only the carbon that goes in the atmosphere. Uh, does anybody know or want to guess a company in 2004 is that, is that before most of you here were born? <laughs> so a, you would have been quite young, but uh, a, country, a company that advertised heavily to get people to think about their carbon footprints. Did you say Tesla? They weren't around yet. Elon Musk was at uh, PayPal then, so he was processing payments for eBay. Long time ago, you guys, it was weird. He didn't have any hair then. He's, he got so rich, his hair came back. Um, anybody else have a guess? Tesla was a good guess. Anybody up there? Google's another good guess. Google was maybe five, six years old then, but not Google. You're really close. Shell is a good guess. Not Exxon. BP, British Petroleum. So British Petroleum is an interesting company to be encouraging people to think about their carbon footprint. So in 2004, they hired uh, a, a well-known PR company to get this idea out into the broader public that we are kind of all responsible, you, me, you know, your grandma, we're responsible for coming clean and thinking about our carbon footprints. Um, and, you know, they have a number of reasons for doing this, but some people have speculated that part of the reason for doing this is to transfer the, the responsibility a little bit from the company as an organization to reduce fossil fuel consumption. It's kind of hard to reduce fossil fuel consumption if you sell fossil fuels. Um, or to want to at least, but, and to get the individual consumer so you or me to think, well, boy, I better lower my carbon footprint. It's kind of my fault that we are putting so much carbon in the atmosphere. And so I think this is kind of the most overt example of just really trying to shift kind of the onus onto you or to me to think about our carbon footprints. Um, so to kind of to sum it up, they actually created even the first carbon footprint calculator. So the ones that you've used are probably different than the one BP created, but they created a a fairly inaccurate and kind of quickly thrown together carbon footprint calculator, and then they really push this message to the public that you need to reduce your carbon footprint um, and, and that we are just supplying kind of the fossil fuels. You're the ones using them. The problem is this kind of ignores the fact that the only real way for all of us to significantly reduce our carbon footprints is by switching from fossil fuels to renewable or non-emitting non uh, carbon sources of energy, heat, electricity, all of those things that, that we talked about. So from a sports metaphor, it's sort of like the example of if your coach just looked at like you individually and is like, you know, we're losing because you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> we just need you to try a little bit harder and then we'll win, right? Not really taking a role in, in shaping that future. And so when you think about the sustainability through this sports analogy, it, it's helpful because you just can't win games by, your, by yourself. You just can't make real change. You've got to work uh, as a team. So you know, you or I could make some individual choices, like maybe we could get our, you know, for you guys, ask your parents to put solar panels on the roof, or, you know, if I could uh, <laughs> come up with that chunk of change, I could put solar panels on my roof. You know, we could stop buying plastic, and we could drive electric vehicles, place our furnaces with heat pumps. So there's a bunch of things we can do, but a lot of those are really expensive, and if we rely on becoming uh, a sustainable country and world, by having individual families make expensive choices like that, it, we're just not gonna get anywhere. Um, and this probably makes some intuitive sense, but we have some data to support this. So Catherine Hayhoe is one of the leading uh, climate change communicators and scientists. And her math, uh, which is supported by a lot of other scientists, is we could get about 40% of the way to reducing our carbon emissions just by individual choices. So in other words, if you and me and everybody in America and in uh, wealthy industrialized countries 
chose as sustainably as we can when we go to the grocery store, when we build a house, when we fill up our cars, when we buy our cars, we wouldn't even be halfway to the solution. Uh, and so over half of the solution comes from actually having different options to pick from. And so in the sports metaphor, you know, we need our coaches to call the right plays, adopt the right strategies, and put the right players on the field in the right moments in the game. Uh, we can't just decide, I'm going to go make a play uh, and change the game. So that's kind of like asking the kicker on your football team to just bring you back from being down 30, you know. Do you guys, is there a kicker in the audience here? There we go. What's his name? Alfredo. So when, when Friday rolls around, coach probably doesn't drop any plays, right? He just looks at you and says, Alfredo, all right, 10 field goals tonight. No? What does he do? Okay, we better ask the quarterback. Where's the quarterback? Jake. <laughs> Where is he? He's not here. Who is the backup quarterback? There we go. <laughs> So my, my guess is your coach scripts some plays, right? We're going to go with yes, right? So the coach calls some plays. The coach doesn't just say, Alfredo, you know, kick us 20 field goals tonight, right? That's, that's not how it goes. You need a team to get anywhere, and uh, your coach can't just look at one player and say, score us all the points tonight. You need, you need a united front, right? Coach has got to call the right plays. Offense has to move the ball. Defense has to get the ball back for the offense. I'm guessing, Alfredo, you're not hitting like 80 yarders. So you're not kicking field goals right off the kickoff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you need the offense, right? You need, you need a whole team to get anything done on a football field. And sustainability is similar. So for you or I to really lower our carbon footprints, we can do things on our own. But that's just not nearly as effective as if we have governments, corporations, scientists and researchers, lawmakers, some of which hopefully all of you become eventually, uh, who make options that we can select from that are more sustainable. So we really do need the help of giant teams to get this done. So our message can kind of be understood as these two key problems, right? We're too focused on individual actions. Some of that comes from our kind of individualistic virtue signaling society that we live in. Uh, some of it comes from BP and other companies advertising and convincing us we should be the ones uh, in charge of, of lowering our, our own carbon footprints and not really focusing so holistically. Um, and the second problem is, yeah, we need teams to get anything done. Um, the good news is we have some awesome examples of teams in your community right now at your school, but also in the Virginia area that are doing phenomenal work. And we're going to get to those in a second. But first, I just want to really continue to kind of deepen this sports metaphor a little bit. So from what I've heard, and I've already given them a little bit of a shout out, but VES has a pretty solid football team. It sounds like they've been to two state championship games fairly recently. Is that right? Oh, three. Okay, there we go. They said put some respect on their names. All right. Three state championship games recently. So, and then can we just have some football players raise their hands so we know kind of who's out there? So we already heard from Alfredo the kicker and the backup quarterback. So the quarterback, is he's just sick today or something? Or he's over there? Did I miss him? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully some of the football players will recognize this guy. Who do we got here? Bill, I love it. A lot of people didn't do a last name. It's like Bill. So what's Bill known for? What's that? Wow, someone just scooped me. That's phenomenal. That, did, did you see the presentation ahead of time? Wow. A true Patriots fan, or at least a football admirer. That's impressive. Are you the football coach? Okay. You guys beat him a couple times. Those were fun to watch, yeah. All right, so Bill is known for beating a lot of other teams, though. 333 NFL wins, six Super Bowls. That's how you know you have a lot when you can put a ring on each hand and then a thumb. Um, so he did a lot of things right. And his favorite mantra, the one that was shouted out already is do your job, okay? What I love about do your job is it is comforting because it reminds you that there is something you can do about sustainability. There is a job that you have to do. You don't have to think about winning the game of sustainability or making uh, a difference in this huge problem of climate change on your own. If you think about trying to win the game, 
Uh, it can be kind of like feeling like you yourself are trying to solve climate change alone, just with your vegetarian or meatless Mondays. It's just, it's too much of a problem for you to handle on your own. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that your job is not to solve climate change. So you're off the hook on that one. Uh, your job is to do your job, which is to care about sustainability locally on the teams that you're already a part of. So all of you are part of teams. Uh, and you're part of teams that have an opportunity to do something sustainable. And we're going to talk about that here shortly. Before we do that, though, I want to make a little bit more of a connection to your community here. So one of your teachers, uh, Mr. Bright, was kind enough to send out a survey, which over 100 of you filled out, which shared your favorite place on campus and your favorite outdoor space off campus. So kind of two different questions. And on campus, there was no contest. Anybody know what it is? Box, another one word name, Box Plaza. So we got a nice panorama here. Beautiful place. We got a couple of people walking through there on their way to class, probably. Great scholarship. All right, so I spent some time in Box Plaza yesterday and today, and it's just beautiful. I see why it is your favorite place on campus for so many of you. And what I want you to think about for a minute is that someone manages Box Plaza. Now, does anybody know that person? SSC, but there's, there's a man behind the mission. Steve -o. Oh, Steve-O. Okay. I was going to go with Roger Johnson, who leads SSC, but it's Steve-O as well. Okay, excellent. So the reason I want to bring them up is they have a job to do. And part of doing their job, uh, which is not solving climate change, but their job is to do something, which is to sustain, sustain, just one, your favorite place on campus, right? They manage this, and it clearly looks well sustained and well managed and that's part of why you like spending time there. So when you're in Box Plaza, think about those people that sustain it so that everyone at VES can enjoy it and that the future generations of VES students can enjoy it. But you also listed a lot of beautiful places that are outside of VES's campus. Uh, and what I love about these places is they're places that bring you calm and relaxation and I would guess enrich your lives uh, in some way. And what they all have in common is someone has to sustain and manage them. They don't manage themselves. Um, these are places that need some stewardship and some caring for. So one place, which I have been, is the Blue Ridge Parkway. I've done some hiking in the Shenandoahs, and so I've had the privilege of hiking through there. It's, it's really beautiful, and I can see why so many of you chose that as your favorite outdoor space. Um, there are other places, though, that were far away from the area, like uh, the Outer Banks, Topsail Beach in North Carolina, uh, Pawleys Island in South Carolina, Somerville Lake in West Virginia, Smith Mountain Lake, which is here in Virginia. And what I want you to do is think for a minute about the feeling that those places give you, and then to imagine what it's like to spend time with friends and family. And then eventually, I know this is maybe challenging to do right now, but think about potentially your kids or grandkids spending time in those places with you. So take a minute to visualize. And what I really want you to do is realize that those are places that are not just beautiful landscapes that will always be here that you should take for granted, um, but they're places that you enjoy because someone cared for them and someone made sure that they are protected and sustainable and stayed clean and pristine and, and usable for everyone now, but also people in the future. And then I want you to imagine something else for a minute. Imagine that each of these places now is no longer the beautiful place that you love to spend time and uh, be around your friends and family, but it's a cornfield or a strip mine, or maybe it's been eroded away by rising sea levels. So think about that for a minute and think about what that loss would mean to you if during the summers or during breaks you can no longer go to that place. Just try to visualize what it would look like and what it would mean. All right, you may not know it, but the most common favorite place you all listed in this survey uh, is somewhere that has, in a way, already been lost. And so the most common off-campus answer was the James River. Uh, so many different places along the James River. One is Percival's Island, uh, where I went yesterday and had a nice walk with Mr. Bright. Really beautiful place. Um, Blackwater Creek Trails, another beautiful place along the James River. And then Riverside Park. Uh, and Again, you may not realize it, but in a way, the James River that unites all of these places was, in a sense, lost already. 
uh, but has been brought back, and I want to sort of share that story here. So in the 60s and 70s, long before you were born or I was born, um, the James River was not such a nice place to spend time near. So from 1966 to 1975, Allied Chemical, uh, which is based out of Hopewell, Virginia, was releasing some uh, residue and some basically toxic insecticides called Kipone into the James River. So it was a really potent insecticide that was used all over, uh, but it was released in large quantities into the James River. What this resulted in was a 13-year fishing ban in much of the river, but even more devastating than not being able to necessarily fish the river yourself was the hundreds of fishermen who lost jobs because people around the country no longer wanted to eat Virginia seafood. And this was really harmful to, to those fishermen in their, their communities and their livelihoods. So the sign's kind of small and hard to see, but it's, a, it's essentially a, a fishing ban notice on, on the James River. And today, fortunately, that ban has been lifted. Uh, and you know there is the ability to do some fishing. I've heard mixed results, though. Do we have anglers in the audience? Do you eat fish from the James River today, or could you? So the advice is still maybe not, right? So maybe our recovery story is kind of on the right track, but the government has at least lifted the fishing ban or advisory. Um, but what I love about this story is it starts with a bunch of individuals that are all parts of teams and ends with a James River that is largely restored and largely recovered, even if maybe that hasn't been completed. So what happened was an individual contractor at the Allied Chemical Plant, so a worker who worked with Kipone um, daily, came down with this uncontrollable kind of shivering. He was shaking and just really was scared, didn't know what to do. So he went to the doctor, and a lot of his coworkers had gone to a doctor before, and the company had sort of been telling them, it's stress-induced, you know, take a few days off and come back. It's just something that comes with assembly line kind of repetitive work. But the doctor it wasn't so sure. He said, this shaking just is really pronounced. There's something about it. I want to take a blood sample. So he took a blood sample. And this was sort of against the, the wishes of the company. They were trying to keep this kind of stress-related was their explanation. So he sent this blood sample to the CDC in Atlanta. And when the CDC got these results, they sent them back with a message and they said, I think there's been a mistake. Um, I think you contaminated this sample. Uh, like you must have mixed it up with something in their lab because we've never seen a synthetic pesticide blood level this high. And so the doctor you know, followed up with this, with this contractor, and it turns out he had keep bone poisoning in his blood, just extremely high levels, uh, and they were able to kind of identify this as something kind of, uh, of, a, of affecting a lot of people in the company. So the citizens of Hopewell then kind of came together as a team, and they said, we've got to shut this plant down. We, this, this is not acceptable. This river that we know and love and spend time in uh, needs to be cleaned up. Um, but it didn't just end there. Uh, the, the state got involved, and then teams of scientists came together to research the effects of Kipone and establish this is happening. This is you know, really taking a toll on, on the workers here and potentially on the fish and, and the angling, the fishing community. Uh, and so finally, uh, another team emerged, which is the James River Association, led by a guy named, led by a guy named Chuck uh, Fredrickson. So he works to this very day monitoring the river almost on a daily basis and ensuring that it stays clean enough uh, for you and, and hopefully for your children and grandchildren uh, to enjoy. But it goes even deeper than this because I have never been to Lynchburg. I've never been to the James River before I came here for this trip, uh, which has been great, but I needed to do some research while I was at home in Michigan. And I found a couple small publications incredibly helpful. Uh, Richmond Magazine and Virginia Living are two small uh, online publications that were super helpful for me to even be aware of this story. They did incredible on-the-ground reporting, interviewing Chuck, interviewing people involved in this story. And so what I love so much about the story of the James River is that it's just so many examples of individuals doing a job, raising concern, getting involved, and having the team that they're a part of really ultimately make a huge difference, whether that was the doctor you know, who advocated for this individual worker, whether it was the citizens of Hopewell who came together, state regulators, scientists who documented the effects, the James River Association who leads cleanup efforts and activism, local journalists who tell the stories so that we know what happened. It's just such a great story of how a bunch of people doing their jobs on all of these different teams leads to, leads to a great outcome. 
So if we revisit our definition of sustainability, uh, we can see we could look at it through the lens of the James River. So providing a clean James River for everyone today while protecting it for future generations. So I know I said earlier that individual sustainability doesn't really matter or that it's overrated when it comes to putting a real dent in the problem. And that's partly true because we can't individually choose our way out of climate change. Uh, we need the action of teams. Uh, but we can, through the work of teams, uh, make a difference and we can have individuals who are part of those teams make a difference. And the reason individual action does matter is that when you take action individually, there's something that happens. Uh, it changes who you are and it changes who the people around you are and how they respond to what's going on. All of these individuals who took action to clean up the James River, they changed the outcome of all of the teams that they were part of and ultimately the outcome of the river. So another quote from Catherine Hayhoe I really like is, one of the biggest reasons our actions matter is that what we do changes us. Uh, and the other big reason is that what we do and say changes others. So when you think of taking steps towards individually, uh, individual sustainability, don't think of it so much as kind of actually solving the direct problem in front of you, but think about it more as a vote for the type of person that you want to be. To return to our sports metaphor, it's thinking about practice, right? Practice doesn't show up on the scoreboard. You don't get any points for doing it. Um, but without it, you're never going to have the individual skills or the team performance to win any games. And so you have to practice. You have to vote for the type of teammate that you want to be and the type of person that you want to be. You can also think of it as recruiting. So as we've seen earlier, nobody really wants to join your team when you shame them or you're self-righteous about it. It's a quick way to become the punchline of a joke. So this guy does not exactly inspire you to come sit at his lunch table <laughs> and ask him what he's eating for lunch. Um, so you really want to try to inspire people to join your team through your actions and not look like you're about to have a stroke. Um, again, though, it's not just about convincing others to join you. Uh, it's also important because these votes add up and they change uh, who you are as an individual. So they make sustainability less of something to do and more of something that you want to be. And I think this distinction is important. When you shift your focus from should I, sh should I or shouldn't I buy this, uh, or you know, is this something that I should or shouldn't do, you shift that focus to is this something the type of person I want to be would do. Uh, there's a powerful and lasting change. When you think about, again, is this the type of person I want to be? Would they do this action? It, it makes it more about being uh, rather than doing. And this is true for all aspects of your life, um, not just sustainability. So the way to make real change on an individual level is to adopt certain values or traits that you want to live by, and then to run potential actions kind of through the filter of those values. So you don't decide to ride the bus or to carpool more often just to save the planet. You do it because it's integrated with your values. It feels good to do, and it's something that the person that you want to become would do. So you have to have actions that are integrated with who you want to be. And the result can be a really, really wonderful feeling of having an integrated life where the actions that you take align with your values and align with who you want to become. Um, living this way doesn't just change how you see yourself, though. It changes how others see you. And that's what's so important. It makes them ask questions and get curious about why you do what you do and why you are who you are. It makes people more likely to consider joining your team because those types of people are just, they're joyful and they're welcoming and who they are is contagious. It's, it's kind of magnetic to be around someone who is acting in align with their values. I think we've all encountered someone like that in life, and we're drawn towards them. Um, you might you know, think something like, well, if Sarah's part of the sustainability team, you know, maybe there's a spot for me as well. Maybe I should find out about this. Um, and then the beautiful thing about this is that teammates don't need to vote the same way. They don't need to go to the same churches or live in the same parts of town or come from the same walks of life. Because um, we've, as we've seen in our survey answers, everyone here loves the James River. Everyone here can agree it should be clean and available for future generations. And it's just, it's, it's an issue that we can all agree is important, something that we want to share. So when you see sustainability as protecting resources that everyone enjoys and benefits from, you don't ask the question so much, do I belong on this team? Uh, but rather, you're asking kind of where do I belong on this team or what position can I play? 
Uh, and this brings us to the final part of today, which is the team that is already gathered here today that you're already a part of, which is everybody in this VES community. And what I love about this is it starts, again, partially with an individual. So anybody remember this guy? There we go. That's good. I did not have pause for applause written in the script, but I have to add it. So Johnny's reputation is... He's a high caliber uh, bishop, it looks like. Excellent. So, yeah, some members of this VES community have already made impressive contributions to a sustainability team. So this was 2022, it sounds like, the Eagle Scout project of uh, Johnny Sella, um, building these composting bins, which Mr. Bright and I went and dumped. What would we have? Pineapple tops yesterday, I think. You guys must have had some pineapple uh, breakfast or dinner recently. So we dumped those scraps into these very composting bins. And it sounds like since Johnny set these up, that's diverted over 1,500 pounds of compost from landfills, which is phenomenal. Just his actions alone building those bins. And look at the big smile on his face. I mean, he's, he's proud of those bins, as he should be, right? That's the face of someone who says, come join my sustainability team. That's the recruiting poster right there. What I love about it, though, is it doesn't just start and end with Johnny. Um, he was part of an awesome Boy Scouts team, which is just another great example of a team that can do great work. Uh, and he did this great work because of his, his Boy Scout, uh, his Eagle Scout project, right? So a great example of how being a part of a team changed Johnny. The people in his team and the people at VES, I'm sure, influenced why he chose to do this. Uh, but we also have this legacy kind of being carried on. So there's students here, I'm sure there are many more, but Gloria and Anna and Stella are examples of green team members who have done a lot of the carrying of these 1,500 pounds of compost out to the bins. Um, this is such an awesome example of those people finding a role, doing a job within an organization uh, to bring about more sustainable outcomes. So I know I said earlier we focus too much on individual sustainability and that we don't necessarily want to measure it all on an individual basis, but you guys have some other impressive sustainability results going. So maybe you've seen this graph before, but I think this is pretty impressive. You guys have cut your food waste down at VES to a half pound person per day, which is half of the national average. So that's pretty good. So any clean plate club members here in the audience? I was this morning, Mr. Bright can attest to that. Had two of those coffee cakes, those things were great. But made sure the plate was clean, cuts down on the food waste going to the landfill. Um, they've also done great efforts to reduce non-recyclable materials in recycling bins by 55%, uh, which just makes that recycling of those materials when they get to the plant way better. So what happened on October 15th? You guys got your uh, dress down day that day because not a single piece of uh, trash went in the recycling bins? Or someone went around at midnight and pulled them all out. Something like that. Pretty impressive data, though, all, all around, especially when you look at your start on September 13th. Um, this is great. Uh, so, yeah, really, really impressive to see this big of a change happening in terms of getting, getting recycling in the right bins. Unfortunately, though, in the dorm breakdown, we have one part of the VES team pulling a little bit more of their recycling weight than others, um, and that, that would be the girls' dorm. Uh, coming in at about 94% overall score, so give it up for them. So I know I said we're not focusing too much on individual sustainability, but the boys' dorms, um, how do I put this? So they didn't have an overall score, they just had, they improved by a certain amount, which is good. We want improvement, and I don't want to shame anybody, and I don't want to, you know, it just means there's more room for growth, let's put it that way. Uh, and then finally, we also have some members of the VES community that have set up what I think is really neat, which is the VES free exchange. So this is where people can exchange, it looks like, clothes and reduce things that maybe end up in a landfill and also reduce buying new clothes. So that's awesome. Again, we have a little bit, uh, based on the pictures at least, part of the VES community may be pulling a little bit more of the weight than others, but uh, again, room for improvement. We can get the guys' clothes exchange going again uh, next year, maybe. I don't know. Maybe you guys just informally are swapping out in each other's closets already, but I don't know. Uh, they have it, set it up officially with a VES free exchange. So 
Uh, again, though, I want us to kind of wrap up our time here, one, celebrating these accomplishments that have already been made. There's really awesome sustainability work being done at BES, and I think that is a great message to everybody here that you can get involved in that. You can get involved with the green team. You're already on this VES team, and so there is a job that you can do on this campus already. Um, as we wrap up our time here, though, I want to leave you with a kind of a simple quote from Bill McKibben, who's a leading environmentalist. Uh, he says, the most important thing an individual can do right now is not be such an individual. And so I think that getting together with the teams that you're already a part of to try to change who you are and who your teams are is really the path forward to sustainability. Now, in terms of actually kind of concluding here, I thought a lot about it, and I wanted to settle on telling just a very brief story of the most memorable speech that I ever sat through. Because, you know, gathering here, I'm sure you hear a lot of speakers. So just very briefly, when I was about your age, there's a baccalaureate speech at my high school right before graduation. And I don't remember the speaker's name. I don't even remember really what he looked like. I don't remember most of his message, but one thing stuck with me to this day, and that's because his speech was about Eminem's lyrics. So I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Eminem. Uh, but the message of this speaker was that Eminem is an incredible artist, numerous Grammy uh, wins and nominations, but that Eminem really turned the pain and anger in his life into incredible music, but that he paid a price to carry that, that pain around with him and that anger and turn that into music. And this speaker was saying, you know, I want you to consider letting go of the anger in your life that I know you'll encounter in your future. And I don't know why, but 15 years later to this day, I still remember that message, and I think I'll probably remember it forever. And I think part of it is because he distilled it down at the end and asked us to remember that. So today I'm going to ask you not to focus on remembering who I am or all of these analogies or stories that I shared with you today. Um, I, I want to leave you with something clear, I think. So it is the week of, of Earth Day. It's Earth Week. Uh, Earth Day was on Monday. But for that reason, and because I teach environmental science, we've really used the lens of environmental sustainability today to look at sustainability. But I want to leave a message I really hope that all of you remember in 15 years and maybe even longer than that. And that message is that wherever life takes you, you're going to be on all sorts of teams. You will almost always be on a team of some sort. That could be a school, a club, a workplace, a relationship, a family, a neighborhood. You're going to be on a team. On those teams, there will be resources that need to be sustained so that everyone on that team can live a great life now and a good life in the future. And I want you to broaden a little bit and think about those resources. They might be money or landscaping or electricity use or food, which are more environmental resources. But they'll also be things like time and attention and kindness and love. Those are all resources to share with people. And what I want you to do is consider on every team you're on that it's your job to sustain those resources so that you and your teammates have a better life now and a better life in the future. Thank you for your time today. Thank you.